So today we are talking about tick disorder treatments and what's missing. Because in my mind, there's a whole lot of things that are missing. And I can see that when I start to break down these studies. So I know that so many of you are out researching, you're typing into Google, you're reading the studies. But what I find is most people don't know how to interpret the studies and they don't know how to read between the lines and really start to dissect that study and say, hmm, what's missing? What, what, could, what could we be looking at here? And so I like to take these studies and kind of break them apart for you. So we're gonna look at tick and Tourette disorder treatments and I'm gonna tell you what's missing from this study. So when we look at this study, this particular study focuses on three things, three. Um, and so when we're looking at the three things that this particular study focuses on, we're looking at CBIT, so many of you have heard of that, so that's Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks, um, and this is a behavioral therapy. And I actually have a colleague who does CBIT, but what she finds is that it really actually works best when we're doing it in conjunction with the functional approach that I use, which is looking at all the testing, looking at all the data. So CBIT is this behavioral approach that really starts out very simply. Like if your child feels like mine used to say, I have to do this action or I feel like I'm going to explode. So what happens is when they feel like they have to do this action, maybe they raise their finger. And so we're using competing actions to try and get our body to, okay, we're gonna move our finger, which is a little bit more subtle than doing this, right? So we're looking at that CBIT. Here's what I'll tell you is that CBIT is really pretty difficult for the little ones, for the younger ones. Um, and you have to be very dedicated, which can be harder for the older ones because they're like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna put in this work. I don't wanna do this. Like it is a lot of concentrated effort to work through the CBIT. So that's CBIT. That's one of the, the treatments that is talked about in this study. The other one is deep brain stimulation. I don't know about you guys, but when I start to read about deep brain stimulation, I would be terrified to do this on my child because I feel like there are so many things that could go wrong from, I'm gonna call it diddling in your brain, but like really stimulating the brain. Um, I don't know that that was some, if we were still where we were, I don't know that that would be something that I would consider, just to be honest, and that's me. And maybe you as a parent are like really considering that or thinking about that, but we're looking at, you know, three distinct things here. We're gonna talk about the third one in a second. But one is a, a behavioral therapy. And the thing about CBIT is that it's one of the only therapies that is really promoted by the Tourette's Association. They actually teach CBIT. What you have to understand about the Tourette's Association is that they are very, very particular about what studies and information that they look at. So there was actually a study where they looked at diet on the impact of ticks and Tourette's. And the, t the, Tourette's, uh, the Tourette's Association would not promote that data, which basically showed that all of these people had improved symptoms when they changed their diets because they felt like the sample size wasn't big enough. And it was like between 30 and 50 people. Um, but they all saw improvement, but the Tourette's Association didn't want to support that because they felt like the sample size wasn't big enough. It's really, really hard to get the funding to support any um, natural approach studies in the first place. And so if they're privately funded, those sample sizes are going to be much smaller. So just understand that like what's promoted by the Tourette's Association <clears throat> is very limited because they are very limited in their scope. So that's one. So in this study, they looked at CBIT, they looked at deep brain stimulation, and then they looked at neuromodulation. So you're probably wondering, well, what the heck is neuromodulation, right? Um, so neuromodulation, and I'm gonna give you like, the textbook definition is an implantable or non-implantable technology, electrical or chemical that impacts neural interfaces. Let's talk a little bit about neural modulation. Money, 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 money. That is big business. So let's talk about neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is worldwide, the industry in 2018 was $2.4 billion. In 2022, it was $13.3 billion. So you, these devices for neuromodulation are bringing in big, big money. 
And so it's going to be harder for you as a parent to get access to this neuromodulation unless you really <coughs> have the funds. Because I'm telling you, your insurance is not paying for this neuromodulation. It's not happening. Um, but it, one of the things that to me is really interesting is that it's really big business. And so a lot of these studies like to look at things that are going to improve big business. So when you start to look at the people who are like funding these studies, oh, well, look at the people that are funding this study. And I don't know that for sure in this case, because I really didn't dig that deep into who was funding this particular study. But I found it very interesting where we're using two forms of technological devices to improve our health. One is deep brain stimulation. The other is neuromodulation. Let me get a drink. <coughs> so when I'm looking at these studies, I'm like, well, that's kind of a cool study, but what's missing? So we're going to break that down for you right now. Let's, let's talk about where there's some disconnect. So we're looking at this study and this study is only looking at three, three possibilities for quote unquote treatment. They're, they're not looking at this big, broader view of what that really could look like for people. So we're going to talk about that. So what I want to talk about first is a prime example of what I consider to be wrong with modern medicine. And do not get me wrong. Like we need doctors. We need physicians. You have a heart attack. You break an arm. You need a physician in your life. Um, but we can also do that in conjunction with some alternative natural approaches that are really different from that conventional model because in that conventional model, you know, most doctors, what they're learning in medical school is about 30 years behind in the studies. They're not looking at the study from 2022 when they're in medical school right now. They're looking at much older studies because they have to look at those studies, they have to vet those studies, they have to write the textbooks and then they have to teach it in the school. So. You know, you, you need, we need, we need physicians, but we also need people who are really looking at it from a different perspective. Like I am, I think it works really well in conjunction together. So what I want to talk about is one of the things that I feel is, is just greatly lacking. So one of the new studies that came out, I think it was yesterday, is that new childhood obesity recommendations by the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is the American Academy of Pediatrics. This is, you know, where all of our pediatricians are, are getting their data. The recommendations that they're making for childhood obesity includes surgery and weight loss medications. Not one mention of how to keep it from happening in the first place. And no mention of eating healthy, how to prevent the obesity in the first place. So, you know, they're saying now, oh, it's, it's okay for, you know, a 13 year old to get gastric bypass surgery. Do you know when you do gastric bypass surgery that you have to take special nutrients for the rest of your life because your stomach cannot properly absorb nutrients at, or digest so that your intestines can properly digest, absorb nutrients for the rest of your life. And so we're, we're not looking at no mention of how to prevent this in the first place, like, throw away your Cheerios and your hot Cheetos. Um, no mention of how to present, prevent it in the first place. So it's not, it's a matter of how do we fix it with our magical pill or surgery instead of why is it happening in the first place? And this is my problem with this, with this study of treatments. We're going to call them quote unquote treatments. My problem with it is we're not asking why are these kids experiencing tics in the first place? Why are they being diagnosed with Tourette's in the first place? We're just saying, okay, here's the therapies that might work if they don't tell you to sweep it under the rug first. So I feel like there's so many missing pieces of the puzzle. And you know, you're going to hear me talk about puzzle, puzzle, puzzle. Puzzle is a really um, key word for me and the clients that I work with because that's what we're doing. We're putting together a puzzle and I don't want to leave any stone unturned. I'm not here to like bash conventional medicine. I just feel like there's things missing. This is why we aren't getting answers as parents because there's things missing. What they're learning is old. What they're looking at is this quick fix. And so we're going to dig into this study a little bit more. So let's hit it. So this study recommends DBIT, neuromodulation, and deep brain stimulation. Three kind of things. Um, Let 
What's missing from the study? We'll just go with it. Why the hell is this happening in the first place? Why is it happening in the first place? Why are we not saying, why is this happening? We're just like, how do we fix it? But not why is it happening? So if you know why it's happening, then you can better start to create a fix for it and have a plan. Whereas if you're just saying, how do I fix it? You're overlooking all of these things that are hidden in the body. So one of the big things that I feel like this study and many studies, probably all of the studies that we are going to talk about are missing is hidden stressors, hidden stressors. You know, I'm going to mention probably every single time that my favorite, favorite, favorite study is about kids with tics and Tourette's and other um, comorbidities like OCD, SPD, ASD, how they have dysregulated immune systems. Yeah, okay, but why? Why do they have dysregulated immune systems? So when we're looking at what this particular study is missing is it's missing everything. Um, what are those hidden stressors? What is causing that dysregulated immune system? So when I talk about hidden stressors, we're talking about hormones, you know, and you, you guys think hormones like estrogen, testosterone, but there's other hormones in the body. There's cortisol, you know, there's insulin. We have to look at the other hormone balance in the body. So hidden stands for hormones, immune, what the hell is happening with your immune system, digestion, what's happening in your digestive system, uh, detoxification, energy production, looking at mitochondria, how well your child um, creates mitochondria, and then neurological, what's happening with the brain. So N is at the end, H-I-D-D-E-N, in neurological, oh, way down here. Some people would call it neurotransmitters, but I really feel like neurological is a better fit here. Um, and so we need to look at these hidden stressors, like what is happening in our hormones, immune, digestion, detoxification, energy production, um, neurological system, what's happening? Why are we having an imbalance here? And I look at four factors. I look at environmental. So one of the hidden stressors that we're going to look at can be environmental, meaning what's happening in your environment? Is your home moldy? Is your, um, are you using a bunch of toxic crap like Glade plugins and Febreze? Um, are you burning scented candles? What's your laundry detergent like? What's your toothpaste like? What's happening in your environment? Are you, what's happening in your environment? Are you eating crap? What's happening in your environment? So there's environmental stressors. Then there's biological stressors. What's happening in here? What's happening in your body? Are there hidden infections? Is there mold toxicity? Is there heavy metals? What's happening in the body that could be causing biological stress? And then we look at physical stressors. Does your kid sit on their bootay all day? Do they, you know, go to school, sit in their chair, and then come home and sit at their desk and be like, you know, what is that physical stressors? Is there some alignment issues? You know, we talk a little bit about chiropractic being com very complementary to what I do. Like, is there some physical issues? Um, and then mental. You know, a lot of people, when they hear about stress, they automatically go to the mental piece. Like, my boss is a jerk. My, you know, there's a bully at school. We're not thinking about, like, all of the other stressors, environmental, biological, physical. But there's mental stress. I mean, you are, do deal with maybe your boss is a jerk or maybe, you know, you as a mom, I, I say this all the time, is that an anxious mom feeds an anxious child. If you are anxious as a mom, your kid feels that. Your kid gets that. That is going to be a mental stressor for them. If you are stressed out too, you got to work on yourself too. That's part of the process. So environmental, biological, physical, mental, where is that source of inflammation coming from? Um, <clears throat> so one, why is it happening in the first place? Two, what are those hidden stressors? And three, here's the third piece, is this connection between all of your body systems. We go to school, we learn like you have a digestive system, you have a nervous system, you have an immune system, but we're not ever taught about how all of those bad boys connect, how they are all connected. And this is where holistic comes in. Holistic is looking at that whole body connection. It's not I'm gonna rub crystals on you and sage you. That's not what we do. We're looking at the data and we're looking at how all of those body systems are connected. So to me, this study is missing humongous pieces of the puzzle because we're not looking at why the hell it's happening in the first place. We're not looking at what those hidden stressors are. And then we're not looking at the connection between our body systems. Your neurological system and your immune system, they're connected. Your neurological system, your brain and your spinal cord and your digestive system, they're connected. If you don't think that they impact each other, wrong we so so wrong they are all connected um so when we are looking at this study yes you know for some people like changing that behavior having those competing behaviors 
it can be complimentary. It can be complimentary, but if you're not figuring out where it's coming from in the first place, you are missing pieces of the puzzle. So, um, you know, neuromodulation and deep brain stimulation, those bad boys are not going to be cheap. They're going to be expensive and you may not be getting to the root. You know, when we're doing what we're doing, we're really looking at that, that root. What's happening? What's happening under the hood? What's happening in here? 